Hi, everyone. Uh, kia ora. Um, so I'm going to start in a, here's the deal. I, um, I don't have a presentation, and I have gotten into the habit of, of writing a speech and then being at an event uh, and then having to rewrite the speech uh, because of my experience at the event, and, and this is sort of no different. Um, and I'm feeling a lot of gratitude, and I want to um, talk about that for a second before I sort of get into the meat of this. Um, I think part of that might be jet lag. Um, I think part of that might be being in Auckland because it's beautiful here and everyone is unusually kind. I don't know if that's a here thing or just a normal Auckland thing. Um, but I've also been at a lot of these conferences and, and I'm struck by the fact that this one feels different. Um, and it feels different in part because I don't think I've ever been at one where it is more than 50% women. Um, and I don't think that I've been to one that has this level of diversity of all sorts. And it feels different, and it feels good. And um, I want to thank all of you for that. Um, I, I also want to start by, by thanking uh, the incredible team behind the Power of Inclusion Summit. Um, the, the Walt Disney Company, obviously, WIFTI, um, and the New Zealand Film Commission. And I want to highlight especially uh, Esther and, and Courtney, um, who have just been incredible hosts uh, to me personally, and I'm sure to everybody. Um, and I also want to thank all the other speakers, because um, after my panel yesterday, I was sort of tucked back in the corner over there uh, and just constantly inspired by what I was hearing. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out, they're not here right now, but to the sign inter uh, translators um, who sort of been doing heroic work all day long. So I don't, I don't know where they are right now, but they deserve a hell of a lot of credit. Um, and, I, and I specifically want to call out um, the participants in the Being the Change talks yesterday. Uh, Julie, Julie Zhu, Philip Patson, uh, Tao Gago, uh, JC Tanuvasa, Henrietta Bollinger, Malika Bilal, and Anish Scottney. Um, each of you, I don't know if any, yeah, please. Um, each of you had me in my feelings, so thank you for that, and set a standard that I cannot possibly live up to, so thank you. Um, so this session is called Doing the Mahi and um, Paving New Ground, and, and that I still find sort of talking about uh, the work that we do uh, a little awkward because there's a sort of inherent bragginess to it. Um, so I'm going to try to whip through that relatively quickly uh, and then talk a bit about what I think that work means um, and then try to contextualize it, contextualize it uh, a bit broader um, and talk about a few things that I've been thinking a lot about um, at this moment, uh, particularly at this moment. Um, and that'll involve bragging about a lot of other people, uh, including some of the people you've already seen on stage. Um, so I, let me just start with the story of the blacklist. Um, about 15 years ago, I was working at Appian Way, Leonardo DiCaprio's production company. I was a director of development, which basically means that I was a junior producer. Uh, my job was to go out into the world, consume everything, screenplays, novels, articles, video games. In 2019, it would probably be cereal boxes uh, for the possibility of, of fodder for movies and television. Um, and by virtue of working for, arguably at the time, the biggest movie star in the world, uh, also one who happened to be a white male between the ages of 25 and 40, uh, I was seeing everything. Every agent and manager uh, was trying to get me to read their material because if I liked it and could convince my bosses to like it, they had a go movie. And they had a go movie that would be made with a very large budget, which would mean their clients would get paid very well, and trans you know, by transitivity, they would get paid very well as well. And um, I'm a big nerd. Uh, the hair throws people off a little bit. Um, but for those of you who are familiar with the character from American television, Steve Urkel, uh, that's basically me with more interesting hair. Um, <laughs> and um, so I was a very diligent employee. I would try to read everything that I was sent. I would go home every weekend with a banker's box full of uh, screenplays, usually between t 10 and 20. Uh, this is before iPads uh, and iPhones and all other manner of technology that you read on. Um, and I would read everything, and I'd come back into the office on Monday morning, and my boss would ask me, anything good, anything we should do? And, and the answer was always, no. Um, because the reality is, is that writing a very good screenplay uh, is a very difficult thing. 
And so mediocre to bad was never going to be good enough. Um, and I, I found myself in this position after about a year in this job um, where I, I sort of decided that what was happening meant one of two things. Either I was very bad at my job, which was finding good screenplays, or in fact the job itself was reading bad screenplays and passing on them. Um, and either way, uh, not great news. Um, and it probably meant that I should take more seriously my mother's weekly phone calls asking me if my LSAT scores were still valid and I had any plans on going to law school. <laughs> those, those calls only recently stopped, uh, just so you know. Um, I had been in the New York Times before they had stopped. Um, I, think she's, I think she's happy now, though. Um, but so, uh, one night, literally around 15 years ago, almost exactly uh, to this day, I, I was uh, in my office and sort of desperate to figure out a solution to this problem, and I sent an email uh, to, 10 of my, to 75 of my peers, and I asked them to send me a list of up to 10 of their favorite screenplays that hadn't been produced yet. And I promised that in exchange, I would send them the combined list. And that's what I did. Um, it was an anonymous email, I called up the blacklist, there was a list of screenplays, and I sent it out and went on vacation for two weeks. And um, at the end of the vacation, before I came back to the US, I was in Mexico on a beach, uh, I, I went to the, the hotel like, um, you know, business center, and I checked my email, this is before iPhones, um, and uh, that list had been forwarded back to me like over 100 times. A and my first thought was, oh no, I'm going to get fired. So, because I, I didn't think that this idea of surveying a lot of people about their favorite screenplays was particularly brilliant. Uh, I just figured that other people had had the idea but had a better understanding of the Hollywood rules of the road and knew enough not to do that, which meant that I was not smart enough not to do that and I was going to lose my job and have to go to law school. And I really didn't want to go to law school. Um, so I didn't tell anybody that it was me. Um, and everyone was talking about this thing for the, the first six months of the year. And then in June, I got a phone call from an agent at William Morris who told me, you know, it was the usual, hey, I have a new client. I think Leo's going to want to do his movie. I already sent it to Brad Pitt's company, so you should probably read it tonight, yada, yada, yada. Um, but he ended the call uh, in a way that I hadn't heard before. And it was a bit, it was a mind-blowing moment. Uh, what he said was, was, look, don't tell anybody, but I have it on really good authority. This is going to be the number one script on next year's blacklist. <laughs> Some of you are following. Uh, so here's the thing. I wasn't going to make another blacklist. Uh, I was going to keep it quiet that I'd been the person that made it. I was never going to make it again. And even if I was going to make it again, the idea of someone claiming to know what was going to be number one six months out uh, is roughly would be like someone saying they know who's going to win the U.S. presidential election next November. Sadly, we don't know for sure yet. Um, so it, that was a realization for me that this thing that I created had more value than just to help me find good screenplays. It turns out that everybody had a really hard time finding good screenplays and that there was no efficient mechanism, even within the industry, to do exactly that. People relied on phone calls from gatekeepers, agents and managers. They tried to read as many of them as they could, but that was insufficient for anybody having a sort of steady stream of things uh, that, could, that, that they wanted to do something with. Um, so I did it again the next year. The LA Times outed me as the person behind it. I had a long talk with my bosses who were not very pleased to find out that I had done it via the LA Times. Um, and, um, and then the next year, something really remarkable happened, and that's that Juno uh, won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay, and Lars and the Real Girl was nominated for Best Original Screenplay. And that was significant because they had been the number two and number three screenplays on that first list. And then all of a sudden, everyone sort of that, that's very kind, but I did not write them. Um, so it, what, w what was remarkable about that was then everyone started saying, wait a minute, if, if you make these weird screenplays on, on this list, um, you've got a really good chance of making money and, and winning awards. And, and that shouldn't be a surprise, right? If you, make a good if you start with a good screenplay, that gives you the best chance of making a good movie. And if you make a good movie, that gives you the best chance of making a profitable movie. Um, and that's really proven to be true. So this, this December will be the 15th blacklist. Um, and I want to precede all of these numbers by, again, acknowledging, like, I didn't write these scripts. I didn't direct these movies. I didn't produce these movies. I didn't shoot them. I didn't gaff them. I didn't do craft service. Um, we created a system that allows the industry to identify this material in mass. Um, but what's remarkable is that the industry as a whole has done a pretty good job of identifying 
unusual but quite successful work. Um, there have been about a thousand screenplays on the blacklist over the last 14 years. 400 of them have been produced. They've made $27 billion in worldwide box office. They've won 50 Academy Awards from 275 nominations. Four of the last 12 best pictures and 10 of the last 24 screenwriting Oscars came from scripts on this list. Um, and even more remarkably, uh, a study from Harvard Business School came out just two weeks ago that prove statistically or argue statistically that scripts that are on the blacklist are two times as likely to get produced as scripts that are not. And they, the ones that do get produced, controlling for all other factors, budget, studio, agency representation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, make 90% more in revenue for a worldwide box office. Again, shouldn't be surprising. If you start with a good script, that gives you the best chance of success uh, on any front. Um, but the annual survey was great, but I would go and to events like this or film festivals as the blacklist guy. And the first question that would inevitably be asked of me was, you know, it's great that you made this list that helps people who are in the system get their work discovered and, and get made, but I don't live in LA. I don't know anyone who lives in LA, but I think I've written a pretty good script. How do I get my script to someone in the industry? Um, and, and I didn't have a good answer for this, and I would go back to LA after these sort of uh, appearances, and I would ask people who had been in the industry longer than I, what is the answer to this? If I'm talented and I don't know anybody, and I can't leave wherever I am, how do I get discovered if, if I'm actually talented? And, and the answer was always some version of the same. It was enter the Nickel Fellowship, which is the Academy Screenwriting Competition. If you place in the top 100 um, out of 7,000, someone will probably call you. Um, and the other was, you know, move to LA, get a job at Starbucks, network your way into someone paying attention to you. If you've got the goods, eventually the meritocracy will find you. Exactly. Um, look, I'm, I'm a black kid from South Georgia in the US. I'm acutely aware of the access issues uh, that exist in the world, uh, especially in the US uh, in that realm. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to be a big nerd and to have gone to Harvard and to end up in positions that allowed me to make the transition to the industry. But the only way you can move to Hollywood and, and get a job at Starbucks and network your way to the top usually is if mommy and daddy are helping pay your BMW bill. If you live, if you were a single mother on the south side of Chicago or a suburban father in Auckland and your kids come home from school and you say, pack up the minivan, we're moving to LA, you're a terrible parent. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not a good writer. Um, and that there needed to be a mechanism where if you were a good writer, no matter who you were, no matter where you were, no matter what you looked like and where you came from, you had a chance to have a career in the industry. And so I partnered with a friend of mine who was a sort of tech god, and we built a website that functions like a two-sided marketplace. Anyone on earth can upload their screenplay, they can pay a small fee to have it hosted on the site, they can pay to have the script evaluated, and if it was good, we, the blacklist, would tell everyone in Hollywood, pay attention to this. This person can write. This script is worth your time. Um, we launched that six or seven years ago on October 15th, 2012, um, and the first writer to get signed at a major agency happened six weeks later. Um, we've seen literally hundreds of writers get signed over the course of um, the last seven years. We've seen over a dozen movies get produced, the first of which was a movie called Nightingale, starring David Ayelowo, which premiered on HBO, was nominated for two Emmys and a Golden Globe. Um, and, and probably my favorite story, and I'll sort of start moving to the context stuff now, um, there's a husband and wife from just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, they, uh, they wanted to make a movie. They had written a small contained thriller. They uploaded it to the site and they found a manager relatively quickly because the script was quite good. And out of nowhere, they got a phone call from a company called Image Nation uh, Abu Dhabi. And um, they called and said, you know, what are you doing with the Arabic language rights to your film? And they were like, this is a prank. This is not real, so have a good day. Uh, and they called back and said, no, seriously, we're a real company. You can Google us. Like, what are you doing with the Arabic language rights to your film? And they're like, nothing, sure. We'll, we'll sell you the Arabic language rights to your film. To the, to the script. Uh, and that movie got made. Um, the, the film itself premiered at the London Film Festival under the titles in Zana. Uh, it was Netflix's first ever Arabic language acquisition. Um, and um, the, both now the director and those writers are signed by a major agency uh, in, in the US. And it looks like they're going to be able to direct the English language version of their movie um, within the next year. Um, they still live just outside of Atlanta. Um, 
So here's the big takeaway, and I'm realizing that I'm just out of time, so I'm gonna sort of speed to the end and do some big thoughts here. Um, one, one of the things that we've found, we, we've hosted over 60,000 screenplays in the last uh, seven years, and we've been very aggressive about monitoring the ratings for them and making sure that we don't have any bias based on gender, based on race, based on anything. Um, and, and recently we did a demographic study to see what the distribution of ratings was on the site, and here's what we found. Talent is distributed evenly everywhere. Uh, the distribution of scores for women is virtually identical to the distribution of scores for men. It is virtually identical across all races, across all national backgrounds, uh, with one exception. Women don't submit as many terrible scripts. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, so if you look at the distribution of the scores, and this is the one time I wish I had a slide, it's a pretty standard Gaussian bell curve for men and a pretty standard Gaussian bell curve for women, except at the bottom, it completely falls off. And, and what I've discovered is, if you look at our customer service emails, you'll also see that there are a lot of emails from men saying, my script is genius, your reader is an idiot, and that, that's the kindest version of those emails. Um, but we very rarely, if ever, get those emails from women. Um, and they very rarely, if ever, get bad scores because I think, and, and my guess would be, is that most women know that they're not necessarily gonna get a second chance. If they're putting their script out there, they, they have to know that they got the goods. Um, and, and so what I'd say is two things. Uh, one, if there's talented everywhere, we need to make sure there's opportunity everywhere. Um, and, and the Blacklist tries to be a place where there's opportunity for everyone if you write well. Um, and I would encourage all of you who, who doubt yourself, and it's funny because I've had a few conversations in the last 24 hours with people where they're like, I just don't know if my script is good enough. Here's the thing, you're never gonna know until you put yourself out there and no movie ever got made by not sharing it, one. And two, the site's specifically designed to make sure that even if it's not received well, no one ever has to know. You can get the feedback, rewrite it, and, and move on. Um, thank you, but I'm running out of time and there's, there's two other points I wanna make. Um, so here, here's what I've been thinking about a lot. Um, how many of you are familiar with the name Barry Jenkins in the movie Moonlight? Yeah. All right. So Barry's a, a friend of mine, and I've known him for over 10 years now. And um, it, for those of you who know his story, you know, he grew up in circumstances not unlike Moonlight and managed to go to college and only discovered film school in his sophomore year because he was at an American football game and the film school was in the football stadium. And then he would take his summers and watch all of the Criterion Collection. Um, and over time, and he made a movie called Medicine for Melancholy that was beautiful and small, and then eventually got the opportunity to make Moonlight for a very small budget and one best picture. How many of you know the name Philip Yeomans? None of you. One of you. Is that Tulane? Maybe Tulane's back there. Anyway, um, Philip Yeomans is, I think, 19 years old. He is a sophomore at NYU Film School. He made a film the summer before his senior year of high school that won the best film award at the Tribeca Film Festival this year. Uh, that film was recently acquired by Ava DuVernay and Tulane, Tulane Jones's uh, Array. It'll be available on Netflix at some point soon. Um, and how many of you have heard of the organization, The Critics Who Rule the World? Is, is there anyone? Oh, right on, good for you. Um, the Critics Who Rule the World are a, are a collaboration of eight teenagers in the Kadenda state of Nigeria, 400 miles from Lagos, who taught themselves film via the internet. They have two broken old model phones that they make sci-fi short films on that are extraordinary. And they uploaded them to the internet, and Reuters found them, and Al Jazeera found them, and I and Ava DuVernay and J.J. Abrams are all fans of theirs. In a world that we live in right now, with the internet, there is the opportunity for everyone to tell their stories if they can figure out how to do it. And there's the opportunity for you to get extraordinary work no matter where you are, be it Auckland or Cadenda or New York or anywhere else. Make your work. Um, there is um, a religious quality to film. People go to theaters every week. They watch TV every week. Um, I think it's important that we treat the making of that stuff as a sacred duty. Um, and with that, I'm gonna close with a quote from a major American religious figure, rapper Tupac Shakur. Um, shortly before uh, he was killed, he was asked, you know, do you think your music's gonna change the world? 
And he's like, no, nah, I think that's a stupid question, but I promise you this, my music will change the mind that changed the world. All of us here have the opportunity to do that. I encourage you to think of your process uh, and your making as having the potential to do that. Um, and to quote him once again, keep their heads ringing. If all of y'all are any indication, I have no doubt that you will. Thank you.